Mark said, Oh, yes, I remember. Matthews. Interesting. You've changed your original name, I take it. Myrna said nervously, Oh, no, I... I'm married. Mark smiled indulgently. I see. I assure you there's no cause for your embarrassment. I'll do what I can about your reservation. If there are no vacancies for tomorrow, will the following day do? Myrna smiled, relieved. The following day would be perfect. She was cool and calculating again. Mark walked past Adrian and headed upstairs. Myrna dropped her seductive posture and collapsed into her chair as if she'd been carrying a heavy load. As soon as Mark was gone, Yasna told Myrna, If you don't stop this ridiculous game, all... Myrna said calmly, You're enjoying it as much as I am, Yasna, and you may learn something. Then she turned to Titus, who was still sitting next to her at the head of the table. Titus, were you arrested right after the Magarna Rising was suppressed? Yasna said angrily, How many times will we repeat that stupid insinuation? You know perfectly well he was arrested a year after the rest of us. Titus asked Myr Myrna, Is this what you had in mind as the subject matter for a fruitful political discussion among workers interested in rejoining the stream of history? Myrna told him, Yes, Titus, this is exactly the subject matter I had in mind. Titus told her, Then I must ask you to leave me out of your discussion. The present moment is far too critical to be furthered away in sessions of bourgeois therapy and games. The struggle we face is a collective struggle, a class struggle, and not the struggle of individuals escaping from personal problems. The enemies we face are enemies because of their relation to society's productive forces, not because of their relation to a letter sent by Sophia Nacholo. Adrian whistled, apparently in response to Myrna's unanswered question, and returned to his seat next to Irina. He told Titus, Something just struck me, something that bothered me at the time. When I was arrested twelve years ago, the police asked me if I had ever worked with certain people. The first time they interrogated me, their list included all the people they had arrested at the carton plant eight years earlier, except you. As time passed, the list got shorter. The last time they asked me about my past acquaintances, two years after my arrest, the only name left on the list was Vocex. I assumed people were dropped from the list either because they were released or because they disappeared, and it turned out I was right. Soon after my release, Yasna told me everyone except Vocek had been released, and Sedlek had disappeared. You were among those she told me had been released. Yasna told Adrian, they're not as efficient as you take them to be. Titus was arrested a year after the rest of us, but for exactly the same reasons. Then his name should have appeared on their list a year after I was arrested, Adrian told her. During the first two years, they called me in at least once a month to ask me whom I had known. Zabrin's name should have been added to their list during my second year, shouldn't it? He never appeared on their list. I thought at the time that he might have died. He turned to me and asked, didn't you wonder about that? I told him, the first two times they interrogated me, I told them I hadn't ever known any of the people on their list, so they stopped interrogating me, and I paid no attention to the names they listed or failed to list. Yasna said, it's common knowledge that the police files are crammed with misinformation and deliberate lies. I'm not at all surprised they couldn't keep track of all the names of people who had worked together in a small plant eight years earlier. Myrna asked Yasna, if they lost Titus's name, why was he arrested a year later? Yasna said, I'm sure Titus can explain that to your satisfaction. But Titus protested, I don't know anyone here an explanation. Is this a police trial? Myrna, as if she were upbraiding Yasna, asked her, Why would you want to force Titus to do ex any explaining? He's perfectly right. This isn't a trial. And there's nothing to explain. Everything is perfectly clear. I saw Titus a few days before the suppression of the Magarna Rising, and I saw him again a few days after. Adrian whistled again. You saw Zabrin? You mean he was overseas at that time? Yasna said, How awful. I thought you knew Myrna was Yarostan's wife, Jan Sedlak's sister. Adrian seemed fascinated by Myrna. You told me she was Sedlak's sister, but Glavni acts as if... Yasna snickered, as if she were a foreign motion picture actress, which she really ought to be. She's never been further than a hundred kilometers away from this city. I'll be damned. You certainly had me fooled, Adrian told Myrna. Suddenly he looked at Zednik, across the table from me. And you, sir, is it going to turn out that you're Zagad, one-time owner of the carton plant? Extending his hand across the table, Zednik said, Tabarkin Zednik is my name. I've never owned a factory, a house, or even a car. And if I were a sir, I would be very far away from here. I've been a plain worker all my life. I was a union organizer once. Adrian shook Zednik's hand, but his interest returned to Myrna. Where did you say you saw Zebrin at the time of Magarna? At our house, two or, tr two or three days before the tanks invaded Magarna, Myrna told him innocently. He had just signed some kind of petition demanding freedom of the press. Jan was at our house, too. 
He questioned the importance of such a petition, but Titus convinced me that workers had to be informed by the press before they could act intelligently. And you saw him again after the rising was put down, and we were arrested, he asked. Why, yes, I went to look for him the first time I could leave work, Myrna told Adrian. I thought he might know what had happened to my brother and my husband. He wasn't in his office in the trade union building, but I did learn he hadn't been arrested. I left a message for him with the trade union secretary. Titus came to see me that very night. I insisted Jan and Yarosten had been arrested because of that letter that had come from Sofia Nacholo, but he assured me they couldn't possibly have been arrested because of that letter, but because of the activity in which they had engaged. This was what Yarosten had always thought, too. I said to Myrna, Titus couldn't have told you that twelve years ago. Only two weeks ago he told us he didn't believe we were arrested because of our activity, but because of that letter. Titus said, Since I've been dragged into this discussion against my will, I might as well try to clarify the reason of the apparent contradiction. Then Myrna isn't lying, I asked him. He said, she remembers correctly, but she fails to grasp the political significance of that letter as well as the significance of the arrests. And I'd like to analyze. Please do analyze, Titus, I begged him. Something that was clear to me has just turned into a vast puzzle. I knew nothing about the arrests until I went to your house immediately after I received Myrna's message, Titus said. On that, on that evening, I didn't believe that you or Jan could have been arrested because of the Nashalo letter. The police files contained enormous dossiers on both of you, and the police could have found any number of pretexts at any time, in addition to which you had both recently been warned. That was exactly my reasoning, I told him. What changed your mind? As I told you two weeks ago, I went to the police to learn the precise reasons for your arrest, and I was completely surprised to learn that you had in fact been arrested because of that letter, not only the two of you, but the entire former production group of the carton plant. Yasna interrupted Titus to add, Titus got himself in trouble with the police by trying to convince them to release the rest of us. But then Glabney and Vera set off the appeal for their rehabilitation, and in the process they confirmed the police invention about the spy ring and also made the police suspicious of Titus. Not exactly, Titus told her. I was arrested a year later because I had signed an appeal in support of the free press at the time of the uprising. Not because comrades Kren or Glabney accused me of being in contact with George Alberts or Sophia Nachalo. The matter wasn't that simple. A letter did arrive by the unusual method of a personal messenger, and this fact alone aroused the suspicions of the police, especially since the letter came from a person listed in the police records as the daughter of a man they considered a spy. But their suspicions were entirely groundless. George Alberts was convicted in the police files without ever having been tried for espionage, and I know for a fact that he was no spy. Several years earlier, I had argued with the appropriate authorities that it was totally incorrect and hypocritical to consider George Alberts a spy, and I returned to these arguments after the Magarna arrests, but with similar lack of success. As for the letter itself, I tried to convince them that, regardless of its method of delivery, it was a major blunder to arrest the people to whom it was addressed. I insisted they release not only Glavny and Veronese, but all the comrades who had been swept in on that ridiculous espionage charge. As is characteristic of this police, they relented up to a point. Finding pretexts for releasing several of those originally arrested, pretexts suggested to them by Comrade Krem, while retaining three of the original group in prison and reaffirming their position that the Nacho Low letter cons constituted an actual and not merely a potential danger. I was completely confused and started to feel nauseated. I told him, Titus, you're making my head swim. Tell me something. You knew the police considered that letter an actual danger. In other words, they arrested me because of it. Why didn't you as much as mention that letter to me the first time you visited me in prison? Titus answered, Because the Nachula letter was not the real cause of your arrest. It was nothing more than the formal cause. As I told you before, the real cause for the arrests was that conception according to which errors of consciousness can be corrected by means of arrest and, and imprisonment. I spent day after day arguing with one after another official. I wrote one after another report. I tried to convince them the Nachalo letter, or any letter for that matter, even one from a spy, might represent a potential threat to a coherent class consciousness, but that such a potential threat did not and could not become an actual danger unless and until it was transformed into a program of action of the class. In terms of its content, the Nachalo letter... Its, its content, Titus? Yasna asked. The content of the letter Sophia sent twelve years ago? Yasna had turned pale and seemed to feel as nauseated as I. Titus continued, totally unselfconsciously. Yes, the content of that letter did not call for arrest, or for any action, whatever, and I tried to make that perfectly clear in my report to my section head as soon as I completed my study of it. What should I have told you when I saw you, Yarostan? Arrest and imprisonment was a totally inappropriate response to the letter, unwarranted and unprincipled? 
but I simply didn't have the courage to tell a man serving an eight-year prison term that he was in prison for no reason what whatever, and that there was no prospect for his release. Yasna sighed and fainted. Vera caught her before she fell to the ground. Titus jumped up to help carry her to the living room sofa, and on the way there commented, Poor Yasna, it must be the heat or the excitement. My own nerves are on edge. He was totally unaware of the effect of his re revelation that he was the one who had received your letter. When Titus returned, Myrna asked him, with a coldness that made it clear she hadn't been surprised by his self-exposure, Are you really sure the content of Sophia's letter didn't warrant and even necess necessitate all those arrests? Titus said, There's no doubt in my mind. I didn't deny the fact that the Nachalo girl was deeply infected by her father's individualism, by his complete lack of discipline. She illustrated this by glorifying the hoodlum she found as a companion, and she incorrectly compared him to Yarstown, although he had much more in common with Jan Sedlak and even more with her own father. I also didn't deny the fact that, like her father, and in some ways like Louisa as well, she sought a revolution not of the class, but of private bourgeois individuals, and not in history, but outside history, in something she called a community, namely in utopia. Nor did I deny the fact that such unhistorical utopianism can only lead to a philosophy of despair on first contact with, his, with historical, I should say class, realities. All these facts were undeniable, but none of them justified arrests and imprisonments. The only way for principled revolutionaries to deal with gaps in consciousness is to put forward the general interests of the proletariat and the final goals of the movement, not to arrest the proletariat or sections of it. It is our responsibility before history to isolate and arrest the virus, not to isolate and arrest perfectly healthy workers who are totally unaffected by the virus. And even if they become infected, the historical project can be realized only if we destroy the disease, not the patient. All this has always seemed perfectly obvious to me. Yara asked naively, Do you mean the police did the same thing to the workers that the doctors did to Vesna? I begged, Yara, please don't, don't reintroduce that game. But Myrna protested, It's no game, but a very serious matter. The responsibility of every reasonable adult is to take a sample of the disease to experts who are able to determine the gravity of the infection. Isn't that so, Titus? You considered Sophia's letter harmless, but you're only an individual. You're not an expert in diagnosing the condition of the working class in the light of its historical task. This is the job of people whose special field is the health and disease of the proletariat. Or did I misunderstand you? Titus told her, I hear my words coming back to me, but I don't understand you. I'm sorry I'm so obscure, Myrna told him. I don't understand these things, since I'm not any kind of expert. Zednik, help me explain what I mean to Titus. Zednik plunged into discussion. The work you do in the Trade Union Council consists of theoretical reflection and elaboration on the conditions and general results of the movement. Is that correct, Zabrin? I believe those are the words I've heard you use several times at Prisoners Club meetings. Those were my, those were my words, Titus admitted. Zednik continued, and your work includes reflection and elaboration about such unusual documents as a letter from abroad addressed to the entire former production group of a factory, I take it. For instance, analysis of the historically progressive content of such a document, as well as wh what we might call its dangerous facets. Titus said, yes, of course, but I don't see what this has to do with... With hospitals? Zednik asked, laughing. Frankly, I don't either, but I suspect Yara had a very profound insight by making that comparison, and I'm sure that if we reflect on it, if we elaborate it, are you joking with me, Tabarkin? Titus asked him. On the contrary, Zabrin. I don't consider this a subject for jokes. Zednik said with a sarcasm Titus missed. What's in question is history, the historical project of the proletariat. Zednik's exposure was interrupted by Mark Glavney's heavy steps on the stairway. The seductive expression returned to Myrna's face as she ran to the living room. She returned with her arm around Mark and asked, Did you succeed, my dear? Mark told her, there seems to be some confusion. I've spent the last half hour trying to locate your airline reservation. They claim not to have a reservation in the name of Matthews. Oh, dear, this is simply awful, Myrna said. She pondered, then picked up her leather purse and rubbished through it. Well, I have the flight number right here. It's 357. This was all done for me by a travel agent before I left, and I really should have studied this material more closely. Oh, don't tell me. How terribly embarrassing. I've just come across my itinerary sheet. That's not a flight number, but the number of a sleeping car. I was to leave by railway tonight. I don't know how to begin to apologize to you. Mark laughed, and the rest of us joined with him. We've all made such mistakes. Would you like me to try to postpone your train reservation? I simply don't dare ask you to do that, Myrna told him. I'll postpone it myself. Mr. Zabrin was starting to tell us about history's project. I'm sure you'll find it fascinating. I won't miss much, since I don't understand such things very well. I'll be as brief as possible. Be sure to help yourself to dessert. Myrna went upstairs, and Mark returned to his seat, next to Yara, 
and did indeed help himself to a generous serving of each dessert. Zednik said to Mark, We were discussing certain things Mr. Zabrin, I mean Comrade Zabrin, told me at a club where former political prisoners hold meetings. Mark was surprised. Zabrin attends meetings of that prisoner's club? Quite frequently. Does that surprise you? Zednik asked. Mark said, No, I suppose not. I remember that he and Comrade Nice had that in common. They both ran after the so-called radical sectors to try to pull them by the tail. Vera protested. Excuse me, Comrade Glavny. I've never run after. Titus also objected. Your statement is equally offensive to me, Comrade Glavny. Your social position has destroyed your ability to distinguish a reformist from a revolutionary. What is needed today is not hysterical speeches glorifying directionless strikes, uncoordinated demonstrations, undisciplined workers, speeches glorifying a body which has lost its head. What is needed, Glavny, is something you've lost all contact with, namely historical direction, a self-disciplined working class with a head. The power of such a working class can be dislodged neither by reformist politicians nor by bureaucrats totally cut off from the class, and thus from history. Zednik told Mark, I was trying to determine Zebrin's role in the historical process. Apparently he contributes to it by submitting reports to history, so to speak, reports on the present experience and future course of the historical movement. Mark asked Zednik, Are you referring to Zebrin's work in the Trade Union Council? Has he really described it to you in such exalted terms? It is, of course, true that the tasks of the political sections are as important in, in their way as the tasks of the economic and planning sections, but Zabrin doesn't occupy what one might call a key role in the political section. I've never understood why. I've always thought him a perfectly competent person. He's been content to remain at the lowest rung of the political section of the Trade Union Council. You surely exaggerate his importance. His reports are not submitted to history, but to the chief of the political section of one of the departments of the Trade Union Council. Zednik turned to Titus and asked, Is that true, Zabrin? All that theoretical reflection and elaboration on the proletariat's task does not get submitted to history, but to a mere section chief? For instance, when you wrote up your analysis of that Nachalo letter, I felt tears starting to run out of my eyes. I noticed Yasna leaning on the wall by the entranceway from the living room, pale as a sheet as an ex and expressionless. Myrna returned from up upstairs and sat down next to Mark. The gathering looked funeral. Only Zednik and Yara seemed to have any life in them. Mark was still eating. All the others stared at their plates. Zednik continued questioning, or should I say, needling Titus. I'm asking you because I'm genuinely interested, Zebrin. I was also an employee of the Trade Union Council, but that was 20 years ago, and even at that time I had no insight into the type of work you did there. All I ever did was to transmit instructions from the officials to the workers in the plants to which I was assigned. I never engaged in the reverse process, in analyzing the activity of the workers themselves, in the work of theoretical elaboration. Titus said, it is solely on the basis of, of such theoretical work that the working class is able to resolve contradictions and steer its historical course. Of course, I understand, Zednik told him. Without your work, the working class is a body without a head. But what interests me is the daily routine, so to speak, what you actually do during your working day. I have a very concrete reason for taking an interest in this. When I was arrested in the trade union building 19 years ago and charged with syndicalism, I asked myself, why syndicalism? A charge of sabotage would have made sense to me. Ever since the coup, I had sabotaged every single instruction that had come down to me. It simply wasn't in my blood to give speeches about labor discipline or to communicate threats to workers who took half-hour breaks every hour. But why syndicalism? That doesn't refer to a person's activity, but to his social philosophy. That wasn't anything I had done, but something I had told someone. I searched my mind for the person with whom I had discussed my social philosophy, and the only person I could think of was someone with whom I had innumerable conversations, someone with whose social views I had agreed down to details, although there had been minor disagreements here and there. I started to wonder if that person, who had always seemed so friendly and sincere, had actually been reporting our conversations to the police. Titus protested, I've never in my life sent a single report to the police, and I've never considered arrest and imprisonment correct methods for dealing with questions of consciousness. I'm not accusing you of that, Zebrun. God forbid. Zednik exclaimed. Those questions I asked myself immediately after my arrest were all answered the moment I saw that you had also been arrested. I had obviously been wrong. This police system makes everyone suspicious of everyone else. It was obvious you hadn't reported our conversations to the police, since you were arrested a year after the coup. Adrian said to Zednik, Surely you're wrong about that. Zabern was arrested with the rest of us at the time of the revolutionary seizure of power 20 years ago. Mark interrupted, I beg to differ with you, Pavarshan. I saw Zabrin soon after the arrests. You mean you weren't arrested? Adrian asked him. 
I was arrested with the rest of you at the time of the seizure, Mark answered. Since I had only recently been hired at the carton plant, I had no trouble convincing police officials that I had not established any contacts with the ringleaders. So that was how you got out so fast, Vera shouted. Didn't they know you had been the ringleader's lover? That fact, Comrade Karina, does not seem to have interested them, Mark told her. Sedna continued, From the time I ran into you in prison, nineteen years ago, until very recently, I stopped asking myself who or what had caused my arrest. I told myself I simply couldn't fathom the methods and procedures of the police. But in recent months, that old unresolved question returned to my mind, and it kept on returning. Adrian commented, If Zabrin was arrested for the same reasons you were, and if he wasn't immediately released, you can't accuse him of clearing himself of his charge by implicating you, the way some comrades did to me. Zednik told him, You're right, comrade. If Zabrin was arrested for the same reasons, but you see, he wasn't arrested for the same reasons. He was charged, not with syndicalism, but cosmopolitanism. I knew this at the time. He told me himself what his charge was. Zabrin is a very open person, and it's hard to be suspicious of him. I assumed the police investigators assigned to his case had charged him with cosmopolitanism because they hadn't properly memorized the correct charge. But two or three months ago, in a conversation with some recently released long-term prisoners, I learned there had been a wave of arrests 19 years ago. Certain people were charged with cosmopolitanism. Do you know what this charge means? Vera snickered. Certain ignoramuses in high places use that word to attack anyone who has ever spent time abroad, even people familiar with a foreign language. That was precisely what the charge meant 19 years ago, Zednik said. It was a bizarre wave of arrests. It almost swept away every official who had any knowledge of the world. The so-called internationalists trial. Hundreds of major and minor functionaries who worked in the political sections of every institution were carted off to prison if they had been educated abroad or had fought in foreign revolutions. Then a week ago, while reading the correspondence in which Yarstan had been engaged, I learned that my one-time syndicalist comrade Zebrin had played a prominent part in a foreign revolution. Yasna objected, but without conviction. That still doesn't allow you to conclude he had anything to do with your arrest. In a way, we were all arrested for cosmopolitanism both times, since they connected us with an international spy ring. Zednik said, I haven't drawn any conclusions yet, Yasna. I'm only trying to clarify some questions that keep me from sleeping at night. You had much to do with reawakening my questions, Yasna. Several weeks ago, during a very enjoyable dinner at the Vocex, you told me the history of certain letters delivered by a messenger at the time of Magarna. Letters which caused several arrests. It was you who figured out the manner in which the letters were related to the arrests. You figured out that one letter had been addressed to someone who was an official at the time of its arrival. So I was to have been that official, Mark surmised. Zednik told Mark, I didn't know you at the time, Glavny. I also didn't know that my friend Zabrin had ever had relations with Sofia Nacholo. Consequently, Yasna's explanation seemed reasonable to me. But a week or two later I learned, quite by accident, that Zabrin was not a complete stranger to the Nacholos. Yes, that is a bizarre coincidence, Mark said. That was also my first thought, Zednik continued. However, just before you arrived here, your friend, Mrs. Matthews, was telling us she didn't believe in coincidences. Mark said reproachfully to Myrna, That seems somewhat far-fetched. Life is full of coincidences. Perhaps it is, comrade, Zednik cut in. But in this case, Mrs. Matthews' point of view was not so far-fetched. During the past few months, I've had several conversations with comrade Zabrin, and I've learned he's a very committed person. He is totally devoted to the proletariat, and also to children. He has extremely clear ideas about the health of both, and very acute insights into the innumerable diseases that endanger their health. I don't see the significance of your drift, Mark told him impatiently. Don't you? Zednik asked. If a man with such selfless devotion to the proletariat's health, if a man who had devoted his life to reflection and elaboration in the service of the proletariat and its future course, if such a man had received the type of letter Zabrin described for us earlier, do you really think it would be a coincidence if... Titus cut Zednik short and asked angrily, if he analyzed the political significance of the contents of the letter? Is that what you've been driving at for the past half hour? I must say I'm disappointed with you, Tabarkin. I had taken you for a much clearer thinker. You're muddled to the point of being incoherent. I'm familiar with the conclusion to which your digressive speculations lead. You're not the first to try to make such a point. You're trying to establish an analogy between the work of a proletarian theorist and the work of the police. It's a superficial analogy. It omits the central fact that the political theorist works with historical data and aims at making the proletariat conscious of its real interests, whereas the police are at the opposite end of the spectrum. They work with weapons and aim to arrest, confine, and physically liquidate. I apologize for my incoherence, Zebrin. It stems from the fact that I'm not aware of the difference you point out, Zednik told him. 
That's what makes me so curious about your daily activity, your routine. There's a gap in my knowledge which causes the muddle in my consciousness. You see, I'm only familiar with the work of revolutionary theoreticians in pre-revolutionary situations. When I was a union organizer, a quarter of a century ago, most of my friends were revolutionary theorists of one sort or another. Every one of them engaged in the work of theoretical reflection and elaboration, analyzed progressive and regressive social forces, to find the future course of the proletarian movement and the dangers along the path. Every one of them was familiar with the viruses and diseases which could infect the proletariat along the way, and each prescribed a different cure. But in those days, each revolutionary theorist published his writings in the newspaper of the group to which he belonged, and the publication of the theories seemed to be the ultimate purpose of the reflection and elaboration. However, after the coup, or should I say, after the seizure of power by one of the revolutionary groups, the countless sects, newspapers, and publishing houses disappeared overnight as well as the majority of the political theorists who animated them. Some theorists, of course, remain, but their researches and analyses are no longer distributed by militants at the entrances of two factories, and people who are mere workers, as I've been for the past 15 years, no longer see the fruits of all that theoretical reflection. What I'd like to know is, what happens to all this theoretical work once the proletariat seizes power? You tell me this work is still motivated by a commitment to the historical interests of the proletariat, and I have no reason to doubt your motives. But to whom is the work submitted? To the proletariat? To history? According to Comrade Glavny, it is submitted to a section chief. Titus interrupted angrily. You obviously don't expect a revolutionary theorist to... Zednik's anger was also mounting. My expectations are irrelevant, Zabron. I have no idea whether such a person should print leaflets in a basement, shout from a window, or submit critical reports to the appropriate channels. I'm not inclined in any of these directions. What interests me is how such selfless, indeed noble activity carried out with such irre irreproachable motives, can possibly have any connection with the destruction of human lives, with the immiseration of the activity of an entire society, with the liquidation of all prospects. At this point you're raving, Titus said to him. Zednik shouted, You're right, Zabron. Can you at least tell me this? When we worked together and the Trade Union Council, the year during which we engaged in numerous conversations, much less one-sided than the present one, I take it that you analyzed the political signif significance of my syndicalism, and I take it that you wrote your analysis down. Isn't that so, Zabron? Zednik received no answer. He turned to Mark. Perhaps you can tell me, Glavny, what would a political analyst have written about syndicalism during the year after the coup? Mark seemed embarrassed by the question. In its day, syndicalism was a very progressive historical... I mean after the coup, 19 or 20 years ago, not in its day, Zednik insisted. Mark answered... There were still innumerable progressive elements. Zednik turned ang angrily to Titus and asked, And there were also innumerable pitfalls. Isn't that so, Zabron? Gaps in consciousness, incorrect approaches, and in the final analysis, gross errors, which represented a great threat to... But that's common knowledge to Barkin, Titus admitted. Who can deny that? You personally admitted. I no longer agree with the position, but that's beside the point, Zabron, Zednik told him. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to suggest you urge the police to arrest me because of my incoherence and muddle, because of the errors in my position. You need not repeat that you disown police methods as a way of dealing with problems of consciousness. Has it never occurred to you, Zabron, that men who have seized power over the entire apparatus of the modern state, who have total control not only over the entire network of communication and education, but also over an immense army and police, has it never occurred to you that such men have extremely powerful instruments for dealing with incoherent approaches and errors of consciousness? That's a mistake, Titus insisted. I spent 20 years pointing out that physical coercion... Is no, deal, is no way to deal with false consciousness. I know that. I'm not accusing you of holding a different position. I am told that the inventor of nuclear fission, or whatever it's called, was a very peaceful man and campaigned against the war. Did he or did he not give birth to that destructive weapon? Your reflections, Zebron. Who uses them now? How? And for what purpose? Titus seemed exasperated by the argument. That's a typically utopian position. Humanity can only solve those problems for which the social and material means already exist. The social means for the peaceful application of scientific discoveries are not yet sufficiently developed. Zednik shouted, The social means for making proletarians conscious of what you call their historical interests also don't exist, do they, Zebron? Your, your elaborations and reflections cannot be submitted to ideal carriers of the proletarian project any more than nuclear fission can be submitted to human beings who will not make weapons out of it. I'm not a utopian, Titus shouted. Exactly what I'm driving at, Zednik shouted, banging on the table and red with anger. Your reflections and elaborations are submitted to the actual carriers of the proletarian project, those who currently define themselves as the agents of history. Your analyses can only be translated into practice by history's real agents, not by its ideal agents. You're not a utopian. 
When you analyze the incorrect and therefore dangerous positions of a Zednik to Barkin or a Yaroslav Vocek, do you submit your analyses to history, to the proletariat? When you define me as ill, Zabrin, which doctors do you take me to? Ideal doctors with a perfect understanding of human life and human freedom? Or the actual doctors, coughed up by humanity's historical development? Zednik was sweating. Both Yasna and Yara extended their hands toward him to try to calm him, but he pushed their hands away and continued shouting, Answer me, Zabrin! What does it mean when you say you don't believe in arrest and imprisonment as methods for dealing with questions of consciousness? No other methods exist, Zabrin, and you're not a utopian. You're not an ideal bourgeois dilettante, but a participant in the historical process. When you write that the position of a Sedlek or a Bocek represents a potential danger to historical development, surely you're not surprised if Sedlek or Bocek are arrested. Why are you suddenly so silent, Zebrin? Don't you know the only real, the only concrete, the only historically available agents of your historical project are the military and the police armed with rifles, machine guns, and tanks? Zednik, flushed with anger, sweat dripping from his hair and his face, looked like he was about to have an attack. Myrna, forgetting all about Mark, ran to help Yasna and Yara raise Zednik out of his chair and accompany him to the kitchen. I was too hypnotized to move, as were the others who remained at the table with me, all of them, in one way or another, servants of the same apparatus Titus served. Adrian quickly let it be known that he was stunned for quite different reasons from mine. He let out a whistle and exclaimed, That man is a raving lunatic. And you're a stunted chimpanzee, Irina told Adrian, rising from the chair between me and Adrian and taking Zednik's seat directly across from me. Mark stared at Titus, wiped his forehead, and said, I never would have believed it. What do you believe, Glavny? Titus asked him angrily. Adrian is right. That man is obviously a lunatic. Obviously, and you're a model of sanity, Mark said sarcastically. I was irked by the thought that comrade Mark Glavny did not have the most perfect vantage point from which to express himself so self-righteously. Which apparatus do you serve, Glavny? I asked him. My work happens to be in the domain of political economy and planning, he told me. Aren't human beings obstacles to the realization of your plans, I asked him. Are your plans the practical translation of the proletariat's historical project for which living individuals have to be sacrificed? Mark dismissed my questions with a shake of his hand, as if he were swatting away a fly from his face, and turned back to Titus. It was thanks to you that I was rehired in the carton plant after my release, Zebron. I haven't forgotten that. But it suddenly occurs to me that I wouldn't have needed your intercession to regain my former job if I hadn't lost that job to start with. Titus, with a contempt equaling Mark's, the contempt of a proletarian revolutionary toward the class of bosses, said, That's very funny indeed, Glavny. Mark told him, Yes, it is, Zebron. Extremely funny. The entire conversation I had with you at that time was extremely funny. You didn't only help me get my job back. You also helped me resolve several, shall we say, philosophical questions. On that occasion, I didn't only ask for your help in getting me reinstated in the carton plant. I also asked for your opinion about a newspaper clipping that had been shown to me by prison officials shortly before my release. A clipping about a woman I had loved, a woman who had been known for her solidarity with her comrades. This clipping showed that she was not in jail, like the comrades who had stood by her, but had immigrated with a man who was supposedly a spy. Adrian sh shouted, I saw that clipping too. I tried to bring it up earlier. The man's name was Alberts. He was the head of the international Alberts spy ring, and the clipping proved that Claude Tamnich had been right about Luisa Nacholo. She was the accomplice of an international spy. Mark disregarded Adrian with the same annoyed motion with which he had disregarded me, and continued addressing himself to Titus. I asked you if you had known this Alberts. Adrian interrupted again. I'm telling you that Albert's person was a convicted spy. I had an unobstructed view of Adrian, since Irina's chair was unoccupied. He really did look like a stunted chim chimpanzee to me. I reached for his arm angrily and shouted, Damn you, Pavershan! When was he convicted? By what court? Adrian, nonplussed, told me, He was a foreigner, like Louisa, and Zabrin told us at the time he was a reactionary, therefore a foreign spy. Mark disregarded Adrian's comments. He told Titus, In answer to my question, you told me Alberts had been in the process of developing reactionary, perhaps you even said dangerous, views. I concluded that, that the police might have been right about Alberts. The others started returning to the table. Mark continued, but I refused to believe that Louisa had underhandedly been engaged in espionage while pretending to be our comrade. I refused to believe she had caused our arrest by implicating us in the activity of this Alberts. Since Zednik's former seat was occupied by Irina, Zednik sat down at the foot of the table, directly across from Titus. Yasna took Irina's place next to me. As soon as she sat down, she grabbed my arm and asked me in a whisper, Surely he's not also the one who started the rumor about Louisa's being a spy. How could he? They were lifelong friends. No, Yasna, I whispered to her, but by describing Alberts as a reactionary, he apparently confirmed that rumor in the minds of certain people. 
Vera heard me and told Yasna, namely in the minds of idiots, like Adrian and I. When Adrian and Claude told me Louisa was involved in a spy ring, I couldn't believe it either. So I asked the most authoritative person in the plant, Titus Zebrin. He told me exactly what he told Glavney, namely that Alberts was a man with dangerous views. I obviously concluded the rumor was true. Yasna said to Vera, You wanted to believe it. You dreamed of replacing Louisa as the center of attention, as a popular heroine, as the spearhead of the carton plant strike, especially in the eyes of little Sabina. So you're in on that too, Yasna, Vera exclaimed. I'll be damned. The way everyone here is carrying on, you think I was a sexual maniac who'd spent her life forcing little girls and secretaries into orgies. The fact is, I never touched a hair on Sabina's head, or Irina's. No proof exists for all your accusations. What do you hope to accomplish? What do you suppose would happen if a demoted bureaucrat and his clique started throwing outrageous accusations at one of the leading comrades? Irina retorted, We all know perfectly well what would happen, Vera. We would all be arrested in the middle of the night, given interminable prison sentences, and most of us would never come out to say another word about the leading comrade, Vera Krenna. Vera turned red with frustration and stared at her plate. Mark, raising his voice for the first time, told Vera, your sexual adventures don't interest me in the least, Comrade Krenna, so please don't wave any threats at me. In my opinion, you and your consort, Proffershan, deserve each other. May I return to the topic I was trying to raise? He turned to Myrna and told her, Forgive my anger, dear. I have an urgent meeting two hours from now, one which I cannot possibly call off, and it seems to me this is precisely the question you wanted to resolve, if I understood you correctly. Myrna nodded. Yes, this was precisely the question. Mark turned back to Titus. Your description of that Albert's person was extremely disturbing to me. In many ways, the course my life took was affected by that brief conversation with you. I had known you and Louisa had been close friends once. Shortly before our arrest, a rumor was circulated by comrades Pavershan and Nice, among others, to the effect that Louisa was the accomplice of a spy. Then I was arrested and charged by the police with maintaining contacts with a circle of spies, among whom Louisa was the ringleader's accomplice. As proof of Louisa's guilt, I was shown a clipping which Pavershan apparently also saw. This clipping proved nothing about Louisa's espionage, but if it was authentic, it did show that Louisa had immigrated with the so-called ringleader. I asked you what significance you attached to the clipping, expecting you to defend your comrade from the insinuations. But instead of reclaiming Louisa's innocence, you told me about the dangerous views of this Alberts person. When I met with Miss Matthews, Louisa's closest companion for the past 20 years, she assured me Louisa had never had any connections with the spy ring, and I have every reason in the world to believe her but I still find your position on this matter extremely unclear. Did you consider Louisa dangerous as well? Can you remember well enough to tell me that? Titus commented, Apparently Vera Krenna is not the only person who seems to be on trial here. Mark protested, Excuse me, Zabrin, I'm not a judge. I'm asking you about a person who was, and still is, very dear to me. Titus said angrily, Be that as it may, Glavney, the rumor about Louisa or Alberts being spies could not have originated with me. I had known both of them for over ten years, and I knew for a fact that neither one of them had ever been involved in a hostile spy ring. During the war, Alberts had done certain scientific work for the resistance, and it was especially insidious to accuse him of international espionage, as if he had done this work for the enemy. I forcefully protested the hypocrisy in, in, and injustice of this charge. Alberts was an idealist, a utopian, but he was not a spy. But before the war, he had taken part in the revolutionary uprising. He had expected workers to establish the perfect society overnight, without analyzing the nature of their organization, the international balance of forces, or even the material conditions in which the society was to be established. Such utopianism inevitably turns to despair as soon as it comes into contact with reality, and this is precisely what happened to Alberts. He cursed the workers for having failed to carry out what history itself kept them from carrying out. He didn't only curse the workers, he gradually turned against the proletarian project itself. I analyzed this progression from utopianism to... You what? Zebrin? Mark asked. I analyzed it, Titus repeated. I tried to determine its origins, and I think I located the source of the utopianism, at least the version carried by Alberts, and to a smaller extent by Louisa as well as those she influenced. I sensed that Yasna had started to tremble. She raised herself up and whispered to me, I can't take any more of this, Yarostan. She ran upstairs, probably to her bedroom. Titus asked me, Yasna looked ill. Is there anything I can... No, Titus, I told him. I think she'd rather be alone. Mark told Titus, Please go on, Zabrin. This is exactly what Mrs. Matthews wanted to learn. You say you analyzed the source of Louisa's and her friend's utopianism. Titus finally heard the irony in Mark's tone, probably for the first time, and he hesitated. Then he decided to continue. Louisa's companion at the time of the earlier rising, a very dynamic man by the name of Nachalo, 
exerted an enormous influence on Albert's, and obviously on Louisa as well. I didn't actually know the man, but I was surrounded by his friends, and consequently even I was infected by some of his attitudes, and I remained infected for many years after his death. This was the problem, you see. The man's attitudes were as infectious as the man himself. I don't want to go into the specific content of those positions, but let me just say they were utopian to the highest degree. I traced Albert's utopianism, his subsequent despair, as well as the reactionary conclusions which he finally drew, to this single source, this man, Nacholo. Albert's was a scientist by profession, and neither his temperament nor his specific discipline would have led him to those positions. It was only his contact with Nacholo that derailed him from what we might consider his natural course. As I said, I had no contact with the man himself, but at the carton plant we all experienced the infectious character of his positions. Everyone in the carton plant was affected to a greater or lesser extent. You were hired very late, and consequently you didn't experience this process long enough to draw the conclusions I was able to draw. Originally, I thought that Louisa, in the absence of Nacholo, and in the face of new demands and a new concrete situation, would gradually shed the utopian elements and begin to grapple with realities. I was mistaken. Louisa not only continued to carry Nacholo's attitudes, she infected almost everyone in the plant with them. The only two workers who remained completely immune to this influence were Tamnich and Pavershan. At the exact opposite extreme, Sedlak became something of a reincarnation of Nacholo inside the carton plant. Louisa communicated more of the dead man's attitudes to Sedlak than she herself accepted in her own practice. The coherence, the political health of the entire production group was endangered. Mark got up abruptly. I think you've told us quite enough, Zebrin, and I really must be going now. But you've created an altogether new puzzle for me. If Alberts and Louisa represented everything you say they did... Myrna stopped him. Oh my, you don't actually believe Louisa was... My dear, Mark said to her, it is fortunately not my business to translate the work of political theoreticians into policies which can be socially implemented. My work is exclusively in the economic domain. I believe Zabrin's analysis has a certain amount of plausibility, and I shudder when I think of the ways in which such an analysis must have been treated in the offices of administrators with more practical concerns than Zabrin's. He turned to Titus again. That's why I'm puzzled, Zabrin. If those two people represented what you say, why did our police release them in such a hurry? Why weren't they shot? Shot? Myrna exclaimed with mock naivete. They couldn't have been shot, could they? Louisa told me the police were extremely courteous on the day they were released. After all, George Alberts was at that time an important name in international scientific circles. Ah, yes, I had forgotten, Mark said. He was the wartime physicist. The liquidation of such a personage would have done great harm to our international prestige, precisely at that critical moment. And if I understand you correctly, Zabrin, you insisted on the fact that neither Alberts nor Louisa were dangerous as individuals, but merely as carriers of a dangerous and extremely infectious virus and consequently their forced immigration removed the carriers from our midst as effectively as other forms of liquidation. But those among us who had caught the virus, to a greater or lesser degree, as you told us, and, as I'm sure you scrupulously made clear to the responsible leaders at the time, could not be forced to emigrate. We were placed in confinement of varying durations, depending on the extent of the infection and the speed of the cure. Titus protested, I've repeatedly told you I don't consider physical confinement an adequate response that's perfectly clear to me, Zabrin, Mark told him. Your personal approach to these problems is extremely pacifistic. It is now also clear to me why you have never risen above the lowest rung of the political section of your department, namely why you haven't been promoted to higher levels where practical implementation is a more direct concern. Such a pacifistic approach has not been the most, shall we say, expedient approach to the political problems we have faced. But I must admit I'm surprised. Your squeamishness about methods combines rather badly with the brutal realism of your overall approach. Would you say this is an element of Nacholo's influence that remains with you today? A true utopianism in the domain of methods? But I really must be going now. Oh, must you go? Myrna asked him. You clarified so many things for me. I admit I'm glad you forced me to stay, he told her. Many things have been clarified for me as well. You see, I was profoundly hurt when I learned Louisa had immigrated with someone considered a foreign spy. I had been close, very close to Louisa. I obviously couldn't make myself believe she had been engaged in espionage, nor that she had implicated the rest of us in that activity. But until today, I could explain neither the reason for our sudden arrest, nor the reason for Louisa's mysterious immigration. My inability to explain those events had a marked effect on my personality. After my visit to Zebrin, I made decisions which have affected my life since then. I swore myself to celibacy and devoted myself single-mindedly to my career. 
His comments conflicted with what I had known about him, and I asked him, Are you claiming you would never have been a careerist if the police hadn't accused the Louisa of being a spy? He disregarded my question with the same swatting gesture, and he told Myrna, I have not experienced the desire for a woman's affection from that day until you walked into my office. I hope I'm not embarrassing you, my dear. Furthermore, until today, I had never called off a meeting except in instances when it overlapped with a more important meeting. I attribute all of this to you, dear. You brought me news of Louisa. You brought me the assurance that Louisa has never been a spy. And above all, you brought me yourself. During this confession, Mark had been leading Myrna through the hallway toward the living room, his large arm around her waist. After a few seconds, I heard Myrna shout, How awful! I just remembered that I wasn't able to get through to the train station to change my reservation, and my, cha and my train leaves in an hour. They both rushed back into the dining room. Myrna ran to get the purse by her seat while Mark paced back and forth, obviously annoyed. That really is a distressing oversight, he said. I forgot, too. Isn't there some kind of time limit beyond which reservations cannot be changed? Myrna said, yes, and I'm afraid I missed that limit. That's extremely unfortunate, Mark told her, still pacing. I had very much wanted to have another rendezvous with you. I'd wanted the same thing with you, Mark, she told him. Mark looked at his watch and told her, I'm sure something could still be done, but I simply don't have the time to try to explore the possibilities still available to us. I wouldn't dream of asking you to spend your valuable time that way at this hour, Myrna told him. One of the things I had wanted to tell you was that there is a great likelihood I will be traveling overseas in the very near future, he told her, and I very much wanted to have your home address, just in case. What a wonderful solution to our present dilemma, Myrna shouted, and what an exciting prospect. I'll be so happy to see you again. And your husband, Mark asked. We've been separated for several years, she told him. Didn't I tell you? Please do give me your address, he begged. How exciting, Myrna started fishing through her purse. Isn't this silly? I'm so excited I can't even remember my own address. Mark looked at his watch again and said impatiently, Please do hurry, my dear. Myrna shouted, Here it is. She took out a piece of paper, wrote on it, and handed it to him. Then she took his hand in hers and told him, very seductively, You'll be more than welcome. And Louisa, she'll simply go wild when I tell her. They walked to the living room, arm in arm. Yara, Zednik, Irina, and I crowded into the hallway to watch the parting. Mark kissed Myrna's hand and told her, I don't know how to thank you. Please do communicate to Louisa how deeply I regret the thoughts I left unresolved during the past 20 years. In my heart, I've never felt anything but admiration for her, an admiration the like of which I've since felt toward no one but you. While Mark still held Myrna's hand near his lips, Adrian went bolting out of the dining room straight toward Mark, his right hand extended. Comrade Glavny, I can't let you leave before trying to explain myself. I owe you an apology. Mark dropped Myrna's hand, turned his back to Adrian, and started to walk toward the black limousine, which was still waiting for him. Adrian ran out of the house after him and shouted, You've got to see my point of view, Comrade Glavny. When they threw that spy charge at me for the second time, and when I found out you had been released, and then remembering how close you had been to Louisa, I assumed... Mark slammed the door of the limousine and looked only at Myrna, who stood in the doorway. Adrian continued shouting, In any case, I wasn't the one who started that rumor about her. Then he walked past Myrna, back to the living room, and exclaimed, Damn. Zednik asked him, What's the matter, Pavershan? Afraid Glavny might get reinstated? Adrian repeated, Damn, and dropped onto a sofa, red with frustration and perspiring. Myrna stood in the doorway, waving at the limousine as it drove off. As soon as Myrna closed the door, Yara ran to her, embraced her, and shouted, You are perfect, absolutely perfect, in every way. Zednik and Irina both grinned as they, too, congratulated her. Myrna looked quizzically at me. I smiled and told her, his career still came first, even above the prospect of a tete-a-tete -tete with Miss Matthews, but you were never so, so seductive with me. Of course not, she told me. You never asked me to have a tete-a-tete -tete with you, whatever that is. She ran to me and kissed me passionately on my lips. Then she looked around, asked, but why isn't the bride back, and ran upstairs. Yara started to return to the dining room, but Irina stopped her and told her, they're having it out with each other, leave them. Vera was shouting at Titus in the dining room. So you saw right through me, did you, Comrade Zabrin? You knew all about me from the very beginning. And with whom did you share this knowledge of yours? Why did you spread it? What do you expect to get out of it? Titus told her indignantly, I happen not to be a gossip monger, Comrade Krenna. I, sup I suppose you only wanted your precious Adrian to recognize he was in the grip of a monster, she shouted. And what then? Do you really believe that after experiencing the upper echelons of the bureaucracy, he'd ever again return to a factory job? You're deluded beyond imagination. Adrian is permanently spoiled. 
He'll never again be one of your beloved proletarians. He'll never again be one of your followers. Unscrupulous, shameless hypocrite, Titus shouted, genuinely angry for the first time. Under the guise of devotion to the proletarian cause, you've done nothing but surround yourself with instruments for the satisfaction of your depraved personal desires. You have the nerve to say that to me, she retorted. You, Titus Zabrin, dare to throw that in my face. You who've spent your life maiming and killing your beloved proletarians, who destroyed what you could never totally possess. You have the nerve to throw depravity in my face. I've come no closer to satisfying what you call my depraved desires than you, Comrade Zabrin. But I never went to such lengths trying. There was a long silence. Suddenly Vera was shouting through sobs, apparently on the verge of hysteria. How can you just sit there, so cold, so impassive? Do you know what you've done? She sobbed and then continued. I worshipped my proletarians as much as you ever did yours, but I never did mine any harm, not the slightest, ever. But you, when you lost your hold over yours, you had them maimed, tortured, confined, killed. And you talked to me about depravity? There was silence again. Only her hysterical sobbing could be heard. Suddenly, Titus appeared in the living room entrance. He walked toward the couch where I was and sat down. Surely you're still sober and, un and unhysterical enough to understand, Yaristan. I'm fairly sober and unhysterical, but I don't understand, I told him. He went on. Mass arrest of the entire group was an idiotic response to the actual danger the group represented, but uncritical acceptance of the group's unbridled and growing individualism would have been an equally idiotic response. The potentially explosive and infectious character of such uncontrolled individualism in the midst of a revolutionary situation had to be carefully assessed, not with a saber-rattling hysteria of a tamnich, but with historically tried and tested methods of proletarian analysis. When the most combative elements of the class began to reject not only the misleaders who headed their pseudo-organizations, but also the real leaders of the proletariat's own organization, the consciousness of the entire class was put into jeopardy. Surely you understand this. The working class has always considered its organization as the most precious instrument. Opposition to its organization has always been the expression of confusion in the class, created by petty bourgeois influences. I moved as far to the other end of the couch as possible. I addressed him as Zabrin and remembered how amazed I had been when Yara had started calling him Mr. Zabrin. I said to him, During the war, Zabrin, when I was caught sleeping in the carton plant, you kept the foreman from having me arrested. You introduced me to your comrades in the resistance organization. Later, you introduced me to Luis Inacholo. I have always been grateful for what you did for me. But, and excuse me for putting it this way, I am suddenly curious about your motives. What was I to you? Or, to put it differently, what potential did I seem to represent for the working class struggle? While I was talking, Adrian was tiptoeing toward the hallway to the dining room. I heard him ask Vera, Do you realize we go on the radio in exactly 90 minutes from now? In a muffled voice, Vera said, I forgot all about that. You'll have to go on by yourself. I feel awful. By myself? Adrian gasped. I've never given a talk by myself. The talk I prepared lasts all of five minutes. We'll have Irina type you more, Vera shouted. I can't go on. Don't you understand that? Adrian returned to the living room and walked toward Irina. He told her sheepishly, Vera can't go on. Irina told him, Write your own speech, Adrian. I'm quitting. Adrian was on the verge of tears. Irina, please... Go to hell, Irina shouted. Adrian told her, Don't forget the comrades at the radio station extended our time to half an hour because you had insisted 15 minutes wasn't long enough for our program. Irina hesitated for a second. Then she walked toward me, extended her hand, and looked into my eyes. I'm sure we'll see each other again. She crossed the room toward Yara, took her hand, and said, Please do let me know when you'll go on another one of your excursions. I'd like to go upstairs to say goodbye to Myrna. I'm sure you'll see her again too, Yara told her. We both love you for coming. When will I meet your friend Julia? Irina asked. I'll bring her to your office tomorrow morning, Yara told her. I'm afraid you won't like all the games Julia and I play. Irina said, I'm sure I'll love any games you play, Yara. Irina kissed Zednik's bearded cheek, and Yara accompanied her to the door. Yara told her, thanks for everything. Sisters? Sisters, Yara, forever. They embraced in the doorway. I, took, I couldn't take my eyes off them. Identical hair, identical clothes, almost the same height. Finally, Adrian pulled Irina away from Yara and walked out with her. My eyes wandered back to Titus, who was staring at me from the other end of the sofa. I tried to return to the question I'd asked him earlier. I take it that I was more to you than simply a hoodlum, a homeless wretch, for whom you merely felt pity. I represented something to you, didn't I? I was one grain of that vast mass which could potentially rise the world to its shoulders, 
but which was asleep, blind and ignorant. You provided the necessary coherence, self-discipline, and organization. I was expected to do the rest on my own. But before I clarified my question, Myrna came down the stairway pulling Yasna by the hand. Myrna sat down on the floor by my feet, placed her arms across my knees, and stretched her exposed stocking feet toward Titus, as if to provoke him. Yasna sat down right next to me, or rather, directly in front of me, since I was facing sideways to talk to Titus. Yasna took both my hands and pulled them around her waist. This seemed to be her way of proclaiming that her marriage was off. Feeling an urge to convey the same message to him, I pulled Yasna closer to, toward me, buried my face in her hair, and kissed her ear while I stared directly at Titus. Yara left the door and went to sit on Zednik's lap. Titus was completely alone, and for a second I felt sorry for him. He turned his face away from me and stared down at his own shoes. Myrna said, I'm sorry we interrupted. Please do go on. I wasn't able to go on. There was a long silence. Then Yara said to Titus, Yarostan was asking you why you took him into your organization. What did you expect from him? Titus, still looking down, said, I've expressed my willingness to answer any question you ask, Yarostan, provided I can understand it. I apologized. I was having a hard time concentrating on the question I wanted to ask him. I tried again. What you've just told about Louisa, I suppose you thought all those things about her at the time. Titus nodded. Yet you introduced me to her. You didn't only introduce me. You apparently wanted me to be, how shall I say it, something like her political pupil. Titus nodded again. I was irritated. I don't understand the significance of your nod. I don't understand your question, he told me. I shouted, you took your patient to the wrong type of doctor, didn't you? He looked up from his shoes with a bewildered expression. I could see that he genuinely hadn't understood. I started again. A hoodlum, a lumpen proletarian, was found sleeping in the carton plant. Titus stared down at his shoes again. I continued. He wasn't simply a hoodlum, but one familiar with the city's hiding places, with the sewers and empty buildings, the alleys and underground passages. He was potentially useful to the resistance organization, particularly at a time when an armed rising was about to begin. You took him under your wing. The first goal was to win the war. The rest would come later. But the war ended, and you still kept this lumpen under your wing although he was no longer useful to you. His knowledge of sewers had become irrelevant. What was needed, then, was a proletarian cadre, and this lumpen was ignorant, undisciplined, and anti-intellectual. What you called a merely instinctive rebel had to be transformed into a class-conscious revolutionary, if possible, one with a smattering of proletarian theory. But why did you choose Louisa for this task? How could she have carried that transformation through? Titus said, I still fail to understand your question, unless you want the simplistic and obvious answer that Louisa was an experienced working-class organizer, whereas I was merely a theorist. Are you being purposely dense, I asked him, exasperated? You apparently expected Louisa to shape me into a self-disciplined, realistic cadre, to channel my instinctive rebellion and utopian hopes into scientific understanding of the laws of social development and rigid consciousness of the proletariat's historical task. But you've just told us Louisa was incapable of carrying out such an assignment. Titus looked towards Zednik with hostility and said, I think I see what you're driving at. You're back to the fact that whatever our intentions are, we're limited to historically available instruments, and Louisa was the only historically available proletarian organizer in that plant. There was no ideal organizers. Yes, Yarostan, unfortunately we don't choose the circumstances in which we have to confront our tasks. Yes, I took you under my wing, if you want to put it that way. You are something of a natural leader, and in fact you were the catalyst who set off the politicization of the others. It was you the others looked to. Louisa couldn't play that role at the start because of her unfamiliarity with the local conditions and the distance created by her lack of local experiences. But something went wrong, didn't it, I asked. Louisa started, how did you put it, infecting us with the attitudes that threatened to spoil everything. Louisa didn't start by infecting you, he protested. She went a long way towards transforming you into a class-conscious revolutionary. I must have expressed myself simplistically earlier. The attitudes Louisa, as well as Albert's daughter, inherited from Nachalo were typical of the most militant sectors of the working class. They reflected the class's implacable hatred for capital, its will to struggle against the capitalist order, its repudiation of all class collaboration. All this is necessary, indeed indispensable, for the proletarian struggle. It is necessary, but not sufficient. Above all else, the proletariat needs theory, namely proletarian consciousness, as well as organization. But consciousness cannot simply be placed into someone's head. 
It grows out of the situation itself, out of daily confrontation with the contradiction between the productive forces and the production relations. I see, I told him. So my job was supposed to inculcate the self-discipline. The final result was to be a cadre with Nachalo's implacable hatred and with something like your theory. Precisely, he said, and Louisa was perfectly suited to guide you through such a development. If other factors hadn't intervened, nothing in the world would have made you turn against proletarian theory and ultimately against the proletariat's very organization. Now you're coming to what I want to know, I told him. What were those other factors? In essence, they can all be reduced to Nachalo's influence, he said. But this influence was not communicated as directly as you claim I made it seem. Nachalo combined implacable hatred for capitalism with implacable hatred for the proletariat's own organization and theory. Just like my brother, Myrna observed. And like you, Myrna, Titus told him, it was precisely through Yan.